The, uh, the topic here is the labor movement, the strategies for the labor movement, um, and the relationship of the labor movement and its strategies to worker co-ops or enterprises that are organized in a non-capitalist way. They don't have shareholders, they don't have a board of directors. All the workers together in an enterprise collectively are their own board of directors. They make the decisions together, what to produce, how to produce, where to produce, and most importantly, what to do with the profits that they all help to produce if they're a profit-making enterprise, or the surplus if they're a non-profit-making or tax-exempt entity. So let me begin by making the case, which I'm sure you're familiar with, but won't do us any harm, of why the labor movement in the United States needs a new strategy. Uh, I assume that that's clear, but let me summarize. Uh, we're now at the end of a 50-year period of decline of the labor movement in terms of its membership, in terms of its social influence, in terms of its reputation. It's a rather stunning and sad story. Uh, in the private sector, less than 7% of workers are now in or represented by a union. In the public sector, it's a bit more, 25 to 30%, but it's under heavy attack and shrinking there too. So however much you can, and there are certainly grounds for this, However much you can blame social conditions, laws, the efforts of business to destroy unions, all of which are there, uh, part of the story has to be a strategy of the labor movement that has not been successful, that has either not overcome these other obstacles or maybe has been an obstacle itself. And so I think it's pretty clear that the labor movement needs some strategic rethinking, needs to come up with a set of new ways of proceeding, otherwise it risks already the specter of disappearing altogether from the economic system in this country, um, which is something no one would have thought possible 25 years ago, but which the continuous decline puts on the agenda. The second point uh, about this strategic uh, desire has to do with globalization, with the development over the last 40 years of a truly world economy in a way that never existed before. Companies are producing all over the world, uh, money is being borrowed and lent across all national boundaries, uh, labor migration, people moving from one continent to another looking for work is at an all-time high. Every sign we know of uh, is that globalization is a reality for all economies in the world. Uh, one of the things that that has meant is that it has become much easier and cheaper for corporations to move their facilities from one part of the world to another. Whether it's jet air travel, whether it's the internet, and modern telecommunications, whatever it is, it has become very easy for a company to move out of Wisconsin and into Shanghai, or to leave Michigan and resettle in India or a hundred other examples, all of which you are familiar with. And companies have not been slow to take advantage of the opportunity. They are driven or drawn, if you like, by the reality that in many other countries in the world, wages are much lower than they are in the United States, giving you the opportunity to get the work done at a much lower labor cost. And businesses are always looking for that. Number two, many of the countries of the world are desperate for their own reasons to get out of poverty, to become better off for their people. So they're eager to provide incentives for corporations located in the old centers of capitalism, North America, Western Europe, Japan, provide incentives for them to leave. So they offer tax holiday. They offer that they don't have to worry about environmental rules and regulations. They promise to build roads and housing for workers at a cheap government outlay of money etc., etc. You put that together with low wages uh, and the ability to control and monitor from New York or Chicago whatever is going on in Bangladesh or Uruguay, and you have what we know, which is the massive exodus, first of manufacturing back in the 70s and 60s, and now of white-collar work as well. 
I'm sure many of you know that if you pick up the phone and call the gas company or your computer company, you're going to get a person who has a heavy accent because he or she is working in a call center in India or in Sri Lanka or God knows where because it is much cheaper there. You may also have heard stories, which are true, that uh, people are now getting hurt in accidents here in the United States, calling their insurance company and saying, well, you know, I broke my leg, I was skiing. And the insurance company says, of course, we'll cover you. Here's your ticket. And the person with the broken leg says, what do you mean, ticket? You're going to India. Because we cover you, we will pay for everything, but it's going to be in a hospital in Hyderabad or New Delhi or Bombay. Why? Because the doctor there gets $25,000 a year and is wealthy. And the doctor here gets $25,000 a week and feels bad about his low salary. And therefore, even when you pay the price of the airline ticket and you have a limousine pick you up at the airport and whisk you to the hospital, it is much cheaper for the insurance company to fly you to India to fix your broken leg. And by the way, the doctor in India who fixes a leg went to school at Johns Hopkins just next door to the doctor you would have gotten in Cincinnati or Philadelphia or anywhere else. They study in the same textbook. They work in the same labs. It's the same basic story. Okay, so what have we got? We've got a labor movement that faces globalization. And it takes a very tangible form. And this is the way we're going to make the transition to worker co-ops. One of the most frequent situations labor unions have found themselves in, in the United States, in Western Europe, and now in Japan, can be summarized with the following simple story. The management comes to the union and it says, look, we really hate to tell you this, but we're thinking of moving to fill in the blank someplace in Asia, Africa, or Latin America, or even sometimes a place elsewhere in the United States, moving from the north to the south, from the Rust Belt to the Sun Belt, or whatever. And we really don't want to because we love whatever it is where they are, and we love all of you. When that kind of talk is finished, the hard comes, the hard ball comes. But unless you give us concessions, we're out of here. You have to take uh, less pension or fewer sick days or you have to give up seniority or you have to let us change the rules or you have to accept lower wages or you have to accept lo less overtime. It's a hundred ways that this is done. And this is like a game of poker except the stakes are very high. What is the union going to do? If it holds firm and says we will not allow you to diminish the standard of living, the risk is the company calls your bluff and leaves. And then what you've done for your members is make them unemployed. Most unions find that much too scary. Most members are much too worried about that to, to not do the other, which is to cave in. And so the union leadership tries to keep the, the losses to a minimum, tries to bargain so that the retreat for labor is smaller because the union is there than it would have been if there were no union there. But over time, this game, which gets replayed over and over again, essentially, and sooner or later, diminishes what the union basically delivers to its members. This has been going on for decades, and it has had terrible effects. It has made workers very dubious about the benefits of union. It has made workers open to the critique that the union is taking your dues, but is not really delivering to you very much. Unions have not only not been able to advance the conditions of workers in all of those places, they haven't even been able to protect what workers had won earlier. They're in the game of giving up. They try to minimize what they give up, but they give up. Let me give you three dramatic examples of uh, how this has played out in the United States to drive home the point. The first example is happening right now. In Seattle, Washington, a tremendous struggle at the Boeing Aircraft Company, a company that makes all of the basic jet airplanes, uh, both for civilian and military purposes. They went to their workers and they gave them the basic alternative. You either give us concessions, massive concessions, or we're moving to a plant in South Carolina. 
That was the deal. By the way, they went to the government of the state of Washington and they said the same thing. We're moving because they know they have both the state and the union in their hands. The state is terrified of what it would mean. Boeing is one of the largest employers in the state of Washington. There's tens of thousands of employees, well-paid employees by and large. The devastating impact to the state of Washington in terms of the revenue that the tax brings in of a departure of their largest employer or one of their largest employers is incalculable and they're terrified. And the state just gave them billions with a B in concessions less taxes, more benefits to keep them there. And no sooner were they done and got what they wanted from the state than they turned to the union and basically did it again. Now interestingly, the workers just voted a couple of weeks ago not to cave in. So we'll see now what happens when the workers resisted. But it's a very dangerous game that they're playing. They're in a sense calling the bluff of the company and we'll see whether it is a bluff or not. What hangs in the balance is the economy of the state of Washington and the city of Seattle. It's a very serious situation. Another example. An important part of the mayoral race in New York that was just completed last month had to do with the fact that one candidate, the one who eventually won, made a point of marching with unions, SEIU in particular, to prevent the closure of two hospitals in Brooklyn hospitals in relatively poor African-American and Hispanic neighborhoods. Hospitals threatened to be closed, thereby depriving those neighborhoods of a hospital in their area, depriving thousands of workers of their jobs in these hospitals. I mean, a devastating disaster for the community and for the, the workers. And this mayor, who was a fourth in the list at the beginning of the race, marched with the local people and the union against the closure had no small part to do with the fact that he came from behind and then scored an impressive victory. But the real danger is the hospital can shut. And then what happens? And now the union has to fight again, trying to hold on without giving away concessions, especially when you're talking about hospital workers who are already not that well paid. My third example is the most dramatic. In the 1960s, the center of the most successful part of American capitalism was the automobile industry located in Detroit, Michigan. Detroit was the motor city, the center of a successful capitalist industrialization. In 1960, Detroit had a population of just under 2 million people. So vital was it as a center for work that the union, the UAW, and others were very powerful. It was such a vibrant society of good jobs that it developed the music that transformed the music of the world, the Motown sound that some of you know about and probably have danced to. Uh, its influence was political, economic, and cultural. What happened? Well, what happened was this same story. The automobile companies, Ford, General Motors, Chrysler, came to the workers and said, you either give us concessions or we're leaving. If I had time, I'd tell you the whole sad history. But the bottom line is, they left. They are making more money in other parts of the United States and producing cars in Canada, in Mexico, in Brazil, and in China. And what happened as a result of this behavior of the corporations? Detroit today is a disaster. The population of Detroit today is under 700,000 people. So let's do it again. From 2 million to under 700,000. The majority of the people of Detroit were driven out of the city by the decision of a handful of corporations that they could make more money elsewhere. The children of these families were yanked out of school, out of friendships traumatized, in many cases, with lasting psychological consequences. The families lost their homes. Something like 40% of the houses in Detroit today sit empty. If you've never been to Detroit in the last five years, 
I urge you to go there. It'll give you just in a day or two of moving around the city, it'll give you a lesson in the history of capitalism much more powerful than any story or any book or article you'll ever read. One of the biggest problems in Detroit right now is the problem of wild dogs. 50,000 wild dogs live and roam and are beginning to attack old people and children. Why? Because as the people left, they couldn't afford to keep their pets. They left the doggy behind. And the doggies have lots of abandoned houses to live in and to reproduce. And because the city has no tax money, since all the houses are abandoned, it can't afford the dog control officers. And so they were fired. And so the dogs just proliferate. What kind of a society am I describing? Am I describing some country far away with the problem of wild dogs? No. I'm describing the center of American capitalism, which collapsed. And all about what? The threat made real of corporations to leave when it suits them, when profit draws them. They have no responsibility for the consequences. They leave, and if you visit Detroit, you will not only see the empty houses, you'll see the enormous old automobile factories sitting with the broken windows and the weeds growing up out of the parking lot. Why do I tell you all of this? Because there's a crisis in the United States of a capitalism that has moved on. It's important to understand that the crisis we've been in since 2007, which wasn't supposed to happen, and once it happened, it wasn't supposed to cut so deep. And once it cut so deep, it wasn't supposed to last so long. But why is it lasting so long? And why is it cutting so deep? And why is everything the government has done to get us out of this crisis failed? Because it's part of a longer process of corporations leaving the United States. Over a history of 200 years, Capitalism based itself in, the United, in North America, Western Europe, and Japan. It grew from there. It took good care of the workers there. Of course, the workers had to fight real hard to be well taken care of, but they got it. And so the wages rose in those centers, but not in Asia, Africa, and Latin America, the places from which the raw materials and the food and the rest of the stuff comes to keep the factories humming in Western Europe, North America, and Japan. But then in the 1970s, history catches up. The very reality that the, that the wages have risen so high, creating the standard of living of which the United States was so proud and of Western Europe was so proud, now that very success of workers' struggles to get higher wages and capitalists making enough money to give them the higher wages finally led the capitalists to say, wait a minute, with modern jet travel, with the internet, we can control and monitor our production a thousand miles away as easy as we once did it 500 feet away. We don't need our factories here. We don't need our storage facilities here. We don't need our offices here. Why should we? The very way we developed capitalism weakened the labor movements in other countries, lowered the wages in those societies. Now we can take advantage of what the way we developed capitalism allows us to do. Move production from where the wages are high to where the wages are low. Leaving our generations to wonder, wow, we liked capitalism, many of us, in the first 150 or 200 years of its existence because it was centered where we live and it raised wages where we live. But capitalism has moved on. It's leaving here because the wages are high and because the standard of living is high, because that's how capitalism works. The more successful the working class is in raising its wages, the greater the incentive you give the capitalist to kiss you goodbye and move on. And that's where they're going. That's why the clothes you're wearing now are all made in China while the appliances in your kitchen are made somewhere else, and the car you drive is made somewhere else, and the computer you use, you get the picture? It's over. 
And the real question for the West, Western Europe, North America, and Japan is, do you still like capitalism when it offers you a falling real wage for the next several decades? It's not quite the same experience as the last hundred years when the wages were going up, is it? Yours is the first generation that will not get a college degree unless you accumulate a level of debt no generation of students has ever been saddled with before. That's your penance. That's your part of suffering. Okay. What should the labor movement do? Is it hamstrung? Is all that the labor movement can do collective bargaining the way it always has, trying to get a better deal in wages and working conditions for the workers it represents? My answer to you is a pretty unqualified no. I have no opposition to unions doing that. They've done it for a long time. It gets them a certain distance. But it has not prevented the decline of the labor movement. It has not prevented the loss of the reputation the labor movement once had as the leader for what's best for most people. Is there something the labor movement could do? The smartest leaders all know that a change or a new strategy is desperately needed, that the unions are fighting a defensive battle and not winning it. They all know they need a new solution. So what I would like to do modestly, but nonetheless directly, is tell you what I think the new solution could be and what I think it should be, because it offers a way forward. The way to introduce it to you is to tell a simple story. Imagine you're a worker. Imagine you're a union worker. Imagine you're working with your union and trying to get good wages and working conditions in the, fa in the factory, the store, the office, wherever you work. And imagine you're approached by management, by the owners of the company or the board of directors, and you're presented with this conventional story. We need to cut your wages, reduce your benefits, uh, all the rest, because otherwise we're going to have to close the factory or move the office. So let's talk about how much concession we need to keep us here. And if you don't want to talk to us, we're gone. And you'll have to face the members whom you have now betrayed by not keeping even their job. Now suppose the union responded in a new way. And it said to the managers who, who make that threat, OK, we tell you something. We're not going to make these concessions. We're not. We're not going backwards in time. We're not participating in the slow evisceration of the conditions of life of our working members and the destruction of the reputation of the labor movement from being the, the leader of creating a better life, being instead the organization that accepted a diminution, a decline in the standard of living. We're not going to do it. Well, then we're going to leave. Here comes the big point. At which point the union says, bye-bye, have a nice trip. What, say the managers? They're not used to this. What do you mean? You're ready to, to lose the jobs? Oh, no. We have an alternative strategy, a new one. When you leave, you close the factory, you close the office, you shut the store. The day after you're gone, we're going to reopen it. We're going to reopen it as a workers' co-op. Gone will be the managers. Gone will be the board of directors. Good riddance. We're going to set up an enterprise run collectively by all the workers, because the workers are staying here. We're going to shift from a capitalist enterprise, board of directors, shareholders, make all the decisions, because that's what a capitalist enterprise is. All the decisions, what to produce, how to produce, where to produce, and what to do with the profits, are made by a board of directors, 15 to 20 people, selected by the shareholders, the major shareholders, another group of 15 to 20 people. Thousands of workers and their communities are hanging in the balance. All the decisions are made by a tiny group of people. It is a fundamentally undemocratic way to organize production. 
And we're going to have no more of it. You've sold us out. You're leaving. Have a nice trip. Set up your factory, your office in China, in India. We don't care. We're going to run the factory. We got all the workers. They know how to do the work. They've been doing it for years. We're going to keep the machines here. We're going to take the factory. We're going to go into business. And let us tell you how we're going to do it, dear managers of board of directors. First, we're going to run around the country and we're going to tell all Americans you got a choice. You can buy the products of the company that left and abandoned everyone here in America and went to China. You can buy them. Or you can buy what we're producing. Workers who stayed on the job. Workers who kept the community viable. Workers who took over the factory. You choose. Who do you want to support? Where do you feel you ought to spend your money? Buy your socks from over there or buy your socks from us? Buy your software from over there or buy your software here? Patronize the company that abandoned the United States, that abandoned the workers here, that abandoned the community here, having gotten all kinds of benefits from those workers and those communities for the previous 50 years, if you want, continue to buy from them. But we give you an option you never had before. We're going to keep producing here. Wow. Number two, how would such an enterprise survive? Because the people of the United States would keep it going. First of all, the union would run around and join with other unions, buy from them. Help this project go. And you know why you, ought to work, you other workers should help this project? Because sooner or later, the exact same situation is going to happen to you in your office, in your factory, in your store. So you have an interest in helping this group of workers because you're going to be in that boat before too long. And if you aren't, your wife is and your husband is and your cousin is and your uncle is. So this is an important way for working people to finally have a way to push back against the globalized capitalism that is taking them down over the last 40 years. How else could we get help for these fledgling, new, cooperative enterprises where workers run their own businesses? You go to the politicians, and you go to the politicians with a message they can't dare refuse. You say to them, well, Mr. Congressman, Mr. Senator, Ms. Mayor, whatever, we're going to keep the jobs here. And by keeping the jobs here, we're going to keep the taxpayers here. We're going to keep this city, we're not going to let happen here what happened in Detroit. And you're either with us or you're against us. If you're against us, then every citizen here has a reason to vote you out. And how can you help us? We want the tax benefits. We want the city's help. The first time you'll be giving city help not to a company that can take it for 20 years and then kiss you goodbye and give you nothing back. No, no, for the first time you'll be helping the people who live here, all of them, who work here, who pay taxes here. Very few politicians dare to go against that. Be signing their own political death warrant, and for good reason. So these kinds of co-ops would get political support because they're solving the problem of runaway shop, the problem of destroyed cities, the problem of repeating Detroit. What politician dares to say, I'm not going to help out? Oh, good. No one should vote for him or her. Third, you could go to the churches in the community, synagogues, mosques, I mean, I don't mean to distinguish among them, and you could say, this is a chance for you to make your morality and your ethics count. Do you want a decimated community? There's lots of abandoned churches in Detroit. Lots of them. You want an abandoned community? No. You want the unfairness of rich people becoming richer by paying lower wages in China while the mass of the people suffer the way they did in Detroit or Cleveland or Camden, New Jersey or my hometown, Youngstown, Ohio? Cities, you've got to visit to see them. They're wastelands. I think many churches would respond. They would see in this movement to organize workers' self-directed enterprises, which is what we call them, 
they would see here a way to concretize their moral commitments. They would see in this a solution to the problem of what's happening in this country as represented by all those cities and the thousands of others. I think you could go to the American students and say, you want to do something to change the world? You want to make the world a better place? Here's a concrete way to do it. Help build cooperative enterprises. You've got skills, come and offer them. Come to work for these institutions. Help them. If you're a lawyer, if you're an architect, if you're a anything. In fact, students might be among those who would be asked, you know what? You start some co-op enterprises yourself. Because nothing will make any co-op work better than being able to count on other co-ops to help. And in order to drive that point home, I'm going to tell you briefly the story of what is arguably the most successful co-op of the last half century, in case you're not familiar with it. The name of this company is called Mondragon, M-O-N-D-R-A-G-O-N. Today it's called the Mondragon Cooperative Corporation. And I want to tell you its history so you can see that this is a viable project. This is a viable plan. And before I tell you the story, I want to tell you that there's an American union that knows this and that has entered into a formal alliance with Mondragon to make part of its strategy exactly what I'm saying. It's the United Steelworkers of America. One of our biggest unions, biggest industrial union in the United States, has a formal alliance with the Mondragon Corporation to begin to produce together worker co-ops. Hmm. So what is Mondragon? Mondragon is a small city in the north of Spain, right in the shadow of the Pyrenees Mountains that separate Spain from France. And there's a group of people that have a long uh, civilization of hundreds of years old called the Basque people, B-A-S-Q-U-E. They have their own language, a very unusual, not unlike other European languages. They are Roman Catholic by, by religion as are all the people in that part of the world, in Spain, France, and so on. The Basque people in the north of Spain were traditionally agricultural people. And in the 1950s, they were in terrible shape. Spain had had a vicious and violent civil war in the 1930s. That was followed by World War II. And they lived under a very bad dictatorship led by a man named Francisco Franco, Generalissimo Franco. Uh, a fascist dictator who's, who was allied with Hitler and Mussolini in World War II. Unemployment was terrible in that part of the world, and a Catholic priest in the parish in the area had an idea. He said to the workers in, the, in his little church, if we wait for capitalists to come here and give us jobs, we'll all die of old age before that happens. So let's not wait. Let's set up and run our own business. And that was the first. Six workers and a priest set up a co-op. Okay? And they called it the Mondragon Co-op because it was in the town of Mondragon. Okay, now fast forward. 1956 is when it started. It's now 2013. Mondragon employs 100,000 workers today. It is the seventh largest corporation in all of Spain. It is the largest corporation in the Basque countryside. It is a family, a company, it's one company, but it includes 250 co-ops, worker co-ops, who make everything from refrigerators to raising rabbits for food and doing software programs and developing new kinds of uh, car engines. An amazing array. So big and powerful are they that they have their own bank. They have their own university, Mondragon University, where I gave a talk. Okay? Over those 50 years, they competed with capitalist companies. And they prevailed. And the capitalist companies failed. They grew larger and larger. They have some interesting rules to give you an idea what a co-op means. 
in all the co-ops, the workers hire the managers. This is going to be hard for some folks who are not used to what a co-op is. It's not the manager who hires you. It's you who hire the manager. The managers are reviewed by the workers every year or two. And if the workers are not pleased, the managers are let go. Hmm. Here's another rule. The gap between the highest paid and the lowest paid worker in all Mondragon cannot be more than eight and a half to one. What is the gap between a CEO, the average CEO of a large American corporation, and the lowest worker? 300 to one. The result, wherever the Mondragon Corporation is, the degree of social and economic inequality is that, compared to what it is in capitalist countries where it's that. For those of you that are unhappy with the inequality of wealth and income in the Western world, that's because every effort made to use taxes, laws, rules, and regulations to redistribute the wealth after it goes unevenly to some compared to others has failed. And the reason is the way to deal with inequality is at the beginning. Don't allow it to develop rather than allow it to develop and then try to fix it with rules and regulations later. That's what Mondragon represents. The richest people and the poorest are not very far apart. They therefore have solved the problem of inequality in a way that no capitalist country has ever come close to. Oh, this is remarkable. So there they are, a powerful, successful company. They maintain their own research labs in Mondragon. And when I visited, I was struck that there were two American corporations whose names I recognized who were so taken with the quality of their advanced technical research that they paid for the opportunity of their scientists, Americans, to go over there and spend a year or two or three working in those labs with the Mondragon scientists. The name of the two American corporations, General Motors and Microsoft. Gee, they need the technology of this workers' co-op, not the other way around. Whoa. Oh, goodness. When you lose a job, when they don't need as many workers in one co-op, the commitment of the corporation to its workers is, we'll find you a, a job in another co-op. That's our commitment to you. Our commitment, our first commitment is not to maximize profits. Our first commitment is to secure you in the job that you need to take care of yourself and your family. This is a different priority. And guess what? Their growth is spectacular. Their success is stunning. Do every, does every co-op succeed? Of course not. Of course not. Co-ops, like any other kind of business, also have examples that don't. But you might be interested, a recent paper done by an economics professor at the University of Missouri at Kansas City by the name of Eric Olson studied the rates of failure of capitalist enterprises and worker co-ops. Worker co-ops do a bit better. Wow. Back to the unions. Let me close by suggesting to you what it would mean to the American labor movement if the unions adopted this strategy. If they began by picking examples where it could work. Obviously, you don't take the most difficult situation. You try to start with examples where you will be successful. Why? Because it'll make your threat to a company that comes to you saying, you've got to give us concessions or we leave. It would make it credible if you were doing co-ops that people could see around. How do you do that? The labor movement has a number of ways. It could start a co-op right off the bat when workers are confronted with a company that threatens to close. Some of you know about the New Era Windows Company in Chicago that went through that the last couple of years. The United Electrical Workers worked with that work group of workers who now run a co-op window making factory in Chicago who are threatened with losing their jobs or having to give up con concessions making them among the poorest paid workers in all of Chicago, which is going a ways. So you pick examples where you can be successful. And that could be done. You begin also to pressure the government to help you. 
Let me give you an example of how the government can help you. And by the way, everything I've been saying to you is not about some idea I have of what could happen. Everything I'm telling you is drawn from the empirical record of what has happened. So I know it can be done because it's been done. I didn't invent any of this. So I'm going to give you another example. In 1985, Italy, a country you all know about, not that far away, Italy, passed a law called the Marcora Law. Here's what this law does. It says if you become unemployed in Italy, you have two options. Your first option is to get a weekly check for a couple of years, just like we do in the United States. In Europe, it's called going on the dole. You get money to see you through a year or two of unemployment. You all know what that is. But in Italy, you get a second option. You can choose a second thing. We have no such choice in the United States. Here it is. You can choose to get your entire two months of weekly unemployment benefits given to you right now, at the beginning, as a lump sum under two conditions. One, you've got to get at least nine other unemployed people to make the same decision you've made. And number two, you've got to pool the upfront money that the government gives you and use it as the startup capital for a worker co-op. The thinking behind this law is simple. The government ends up spending the same amount of money. Instead of spreading it out over two years, it gives it a lump sum. But it doesn't cost the government any more. Meanwhile, the workers have now not going to lose two years of feeling terrible about themselves collecting a weekly unemployment check. They're going to be right back at work with every incentive to succeed because it's their own company. It's their own business. And they don't get any unemployment if it doesn't work. They've gotten what they get. One of the reasons Italy has, ready, many, 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 many co-ops is because of this law. We don't have that law in the United States. And I won't embarrass you by asking how many of you had never heard of this before, which is stunning if you think that we have an enormous number, millions of people in the United States who are unemployed who ought to be given such an option because we know it works. It's still on the books. It was passed in 1985. 25 years of experience in Italy. We know exactly how it works. It works fine. So successful was it that when the right wing in Italy tried to get rid of that law, they failed. It's still on the books. Wow. There are hundreds of other examples. This is a viable plan. And what would it do for the labor movement if it began to push, set up co-ops where factories were closed or stores were abandoned, confronted employers? Think a minute. Employers are not going to be as, as bold as they were before because they're scared now. They thought they could make a threat. What could they lose? We're going to leave unless you give us a concession. If you don't get a concession, you go to the place where the wages are cheaper. What do you got to lose? Now you have something to lose because the workers you abandon in Cleveland or Detroit or Chicago or New York, they're going to stay there. They're going to produce it. They're going to compete with you. You're going to go to China. You're going to pay a lot less wages. And you're going to bring all that stuff back. So you have big transportation expenses. But you're going to confront something you never thought you'd have to. Competition from the workers you left behind. And boy, are they going to have a good story to tell to American consumers. Who do you want to buy from? Who would all of you buy from? So now you have a powerful new arsenal in your weapon of negotiating with employers. They're not going to leave as quickly as they did before. They got a whole new set of problems. Number two, when the company threatens, now the union can go to the public in a way it never could before. It can go to the public and say, we are going to save this job. We're going to save this town. We're going to save this state. We've got a plan to how to keep from having the disaster of Detroit and Cle We're not going to let that happen. No, we're going to keep people working. It's the union movement that is going to save us from a declining capitalist economic system that can't deliver here what it used to. The labor movement is going to regain its position as a profoundly progressive social force not just for its members, for everybody, 
for the whole community, for all the merchants that depend on people having a job so they can buy stuff, for the local city that needs those people to have jobs to pay taxes to keep the schools going and to keep the hospitals running. The union movement is going to recover its original position as the leader of working people, the majority, in making a better society. And the corporations are going to be demoted from the claim they make to be the job creators, they will be exposed for what they always were, which is the dis job destroyers. And who keeps the job going? The union. Wow. This is a change and a reverse of who's got what kind of reputation. This is how you rebuild the support of a union movement. This is how you give young people a reason to join a movement because they feel good about it, because they see what it can do in a society, and they want to be part of that. You're changing what union means in people's minds, and that's crucial to revive a movement that has been as beaten down as this one has. So what's the bottom line? Worker co-ops, enterprises in which workers together run an enterprise, particularly one that has been abandoned by the capitalists and others who used to run it, who ran it while it was profitable and don't want to anymore when it isn't. That's their logic. That's their rationale. The labor movement thought it could handle that by collective bargaining, but it's been outmaneuvered, partly by the growth of globalized business partly by the strategies of big business and the ability of big business to control the government. But a movement to build worker co-ops is a viable counter strategy. And I offer it to the labor movement because I think it's the best shot it has to break out of the 50-year decline and to become the kind of champion it once was that it wants to be, and that the ironies of our economic system give it the opportunity now to be if it sees the opportunity and if it grabs it and runs with it. It's worked in other countries. It's worked in this country. And by the way, final point, it's as American as apple pie. Co-ops have been part of the American business scene from the beginning of our country. We have had co-ops in every state. We have, had, we have them now. We have them now. It's very important for you to understand. There are worker co-ops all across the United States. All across the United States. And as I told you, the United Steelworkers are making more of them in cooperation with Mondragon. Some of you might be surprised where you might find worker co-ops. In many religious orders, the nuns, the priests, they work to make jams that you can buy in a store. When you look at how they work that, that's a co-op that's inside the church. Still a co-op. There's a wonderful chain of bakeries in the Bay Area in California. They're called Arismendi Bakeries. No one quite knows, unless you read their literature, why they call themselves Arismendi. So I'll tell you. The name of the Catholic priest who started the Mondragon Corporation in Spain, he was Father Arismendi. So the folks in Berkeley and San Francisco took the name. And they have a chain of six bakeries, if I left the five or six in the Bay Area. There are plenty of other examples. And here we go, last point. A worker co-op is what exactly? It's a democratic way of organizing business. Let me stress that for you. We're a country that says all the time we're committed to democracy. We even fight wars in places like Iraq and Afghanistan, justifying it on the grounds we're bringing them democracy. Well, democracy means that if you live with the results of a decision, you participate in making the decision. And the absence of democracy is when you have to live with a decision that you have no right to participate in. Okay, how are our capitalist businesses organized? You go to work five out of seven days. You arrive at eight or nine in the morning, you stay until five. When you get there, somebody tells you what you will do, 
where you will do it, with what equipment you will do it, for how long you will do it. And at the end of the day, when you have finished pouring your brains and muscle into producing whatever goods or services that are, are made there, you are told, go home. And the fruit of your labor stays there. It belongs to somebody else. And the other persons will decide what to do with it. And who are the other persons? A handful of major shareholders and the board of directors they select. You live with the results. They will tell you what to produce. They will decide to close the place and move someplace else. You got nothing. You live with the consequences. Do you participate in making these decisions? Absolutely not. You are excluded from them. A capitalist enterprise is a direct and utter contradiction to the concept of democracy. It's not democratic. And that's really interesting because where do adult Americans spend most of their adult lives? I'll give you a hint. At work. Five out of seven days, the best hours of the day. You're either at work or brushing your teeth to go to work or coming back and stopping at the bar on the way home from work. But work is where you are. So if you're committed to democracy, that would be the first place it ought to be instituted. But we live in a society that has exempted the workplace from the rules of democracy up to this minute. The union movement, by supporting worker co-ops, becomes the champion of bringing a democratic workplace into existence. What a nice banner to carry. What an attractive idea for people who care about democracy. The quote, democratic revolution was never taken to include the workplace, but of course it should have been. How can we really call ourselves a democratic nation if we exclude the workplace? And the unions could say that. They could become the champions. What a wonderful way to articulate, describe, and gather the support for what is also the best strategic option they have in an ba otherwise bad situation. That's why I believe, and that's why I spend as much time as I do, talking about the history, the possibilities, the organization of worker self-directed enterprises. Because I think among the other virtues it has, it gives a special new possibility to a labor movement that badly needs it. Thank you very much for listening to what I had to say.